All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Trusted Autonomous Systems Defence Cooperative Research Centre's uh, GPT-3. Is it a step towards creating artificial intelligence? But before I begin, I'd like to um, uh, acknowledge that I am <clears throat> on Turrbal and Yogara Nations, owners of the lands uh, of the centre in which we now sit, and we want to pay respects to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits. We recognize that these lands uh, have always been places of teaching, research, and learning, and enterprise. And the TAS DCIC acknowledges the important role Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play uh, within the Trusted Autonomous Systems Cooperative Research Center and defense communities. Um, so uh, we appreciate being on this land and I uh, welcome you from wherever in the world that you are coming in from. I believe we have a global audience today and we are in the one time slot where we can have a global audience that doesn't require somebody being up at 3 a.m. So I'm grateful I'm only up at 6 a.m. Um, so uh, my name's uh, Kate Devitt. I, I am uh, Chief Scientist at the Centre. Uh, the TAS DCRC is an initiative set up in Australia uh, by the Next Generation Technology Fund by Defence Science and Technology Group. If you don't know who they are, um, in America, you have a number of scientific institutions like DARPA that work to try and come up with innovative technologies to assist defence. Um, you can think about what we're doing in a sort of similar way. Uh, we work with universities and industries and defence to build sovereign capability in Australia. But we want to make sure the robots are trusted. Uh, so there's a lot to do with philosophy, ethics, assurance, and legalities. We need to make sure that technologies are brought into human society in a way that we can all uh, get behind and that they're used in an appropriate way. Uh, so when GPT-3 uh, was announced a couple of months ago, um, it has caused a pretty big fuss. My background is in philosophy. So Susan actually had my supervisor, Jerry Foda, um, uh, at Rutgers University. Jerry and I got along very well. We both liked cats uh, and we're quite sardonic. He turned out not to be my best supervisor, but he was a great friend. Um, so I welcome Susan from the old Rutgers crew. I think her book, Artificial You, is probably the best book maybe I've ever read in philosophy that was easy to read and yet nevertheless really informative. Uh, maybe best recent book, but definitely a very, very good book to read. Um, uh, David Chalmers, my Australian mate, um, haven't drunk anything with David Chalmers for a long time in person, um, but, you know, a, a really good friend, uh, an amazing thinker, someone who brought back panpsychism, can't believe it, um, uh, thinks it's great, decides panpsychism is the thing, throws a bit of maths around it, very clever. Uh, welcome, David. I really appreciate it. You're obviously on the cutting edge with GPT-3 as written in the Daily News and uh, just amassing a great research community around this area, which is fantastic. And um, Marcus Hutter, uh, who's another Australian, uh, though in London, also affiliated with ANU uh, and uh, is working on artificial general intelligence. And uh, it's very exciting to have Marcus with us who will give us some technical information about GPT-3, but also go beyond whatever GPT-3 is doing to tell us, I hope, some of the ways that it's not doing things and what we might be doing to improve artificial and general intelligence into the future. So that's enough from me. Uh, I'm going to uh, enjoy yourselves. I will be moderating the chat. So please ask questions throughout this session. We do want it to be collaborative and interactive. You won't be able to use the mic if you're an audience member but I will be checking the chat for questions. I will uh, interrupt the speakers if there's something really spectacular and poignant that we need to interrupt them about, I think. But overarchingly, we will aim to have half an hour at the end of the talks in order for questions to be asked and answered. And uh, I will collect those questions uh, and uh, they will be available to the speakers if they wanted to respond to them uh, asynchronously out of this panel. So sit back, enjoy. And I think, Marcus, I'll invite you to share your screen and uh, take us away. Sorry, now, now you should be able to hear me. Uh, thanks, Kate, for organizing this. And um, 
sorry for my skin color. It somehow got lost uh, in the upload. Um, so I'm a little bit green, but I'm healthy. Um, and um, so I will talk about GPT-3 and AGI, naturally. Um, GPT-3 uh, stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. So that's the third generation and AGI, of course, for Artificial General Intelligence. And the views I present here are my own, but uh, the internal workings um, is sort of um, not my own. I'm not working on GPT-3. I'm just presenting it. Um, so I believe um, that the reason why I want to present is because I believe um, this can inform uh, the philosophical discussion. Um, I mean, you can study a lot and, and get answers from behavior, but it's also good to know a little bit uh, about the inside working of, of these systems. Um, I will not talk much about the applications, a little bit about the limitations, then very briefly about some philosophical questions. I leave that to my um, proper colleagues, uh, proper philosopher colleagues, and I'm not a philosopher. And in the end, if I have time, which I probably won't, I will talk a little bit about um, my research um, and AGI related other research. Okay, so let's get starting. Um, so, uh, by the way, this picture is uh, a word embedding, um, and um, I will show you later um, what that means. Um, so, GPT-3 is a language model, and it's a probabilistic language model, and um, the old language models and also GPT-3 um, work like this, uh, roughly speaking. You have um, a sequence of input words, say, for instance, here, recite the first law, and then uh, the language model outputs um, a new word, like A, and uh, then you put this word on the input tape, and then it outputs a new word, robot, and um, then it gets back to the input, and so on. Um, the other language models, um, where you put in a whole sentence and it outputs a whole sentence, um, the first transformer models um, have been of this kind, uh, but GPT-3 is in a sense simpler than uh, some of the previous models. And by the way, can you see my cursor? Okay, good. Um, so, so the first thing, so these language models are huge neural networks in general, and we have lots of parameters and you need to train them. And what you do is you take a large corpus of text, you input it, um, you see what language model outputs. Initially, of course, it outputs garbage, and then you adjust the parameters a little bit so that the probability of the correct word um, gets a little bit higher and the probability of wrong words get a little bit lower. And you do that over and over again. And then hopefully once the network is trained, um, if you give it some known text from the training set, it will output with high probability um, and recite. Um, so the previous text, not exactly because it doesn't really store all the text, but roughly speaking. So at inference time, uh, you freeze all the weights. And again, you give a piece um, of text as input. And then the language model gives an output, as I said before. And then you put it on the input tape, um, gives another output, then outputs robot, and so on. So that's how you do inference. Well, more precisely, it outputs probabilities for all words. And then you choose the words which has the highest probability. OK, so let's now look into this box, this language model. So how does GPT-3 work? So GPT-3 is a so-called transformer decoder. So this transformer model has been invented three years ago by Google and has really transformed the field of natural language processing. And interestingly, GPT-3 only um, uses a decoder um, and not the encoder architecture. That's one thing where it's already simpler than the previous models. And a decoder, as a transformer decoder is a stack of decoder blocks. And each decoder block consists of a attention mechanism, or in this case, masked self-attention mechanism, and followed by a feed-forward neural network. I will not explain what a neural network is. I will assume that you all know that. That's another simplification. So there are no recursive, so recurrent neural networks like LSTM or so, just a feed-forward neural network. So GPT-3 is much simpler than some of the previous models. It's just enormously big. Um, okay, so let's look at this attention mechanism. So that was the key uh, to get um, the performance out. Um, so traditional sort of old uh, language models, they look at the current word like it here, and then they look at a couple of previous words. And um, the problem is if you look at only a couple of previous words, say two or three, you can't get the context right. So the it refers to the robot, but if you only look at the previous five words, it isn't captured. If you look at too much of the context, then you don't have enough statistics in order to learn. So that's a real problem. And the self-attention me mechanism does the following. Um, it looks at a much larger context, potentially. And in the case of GPT-3, it's more than 10,000 words. 
but then it pays attention just to a couple of words. So you see here, um, it looks at a so-called similarity or may the, maybe one should better call it sort of relationship or so uh, um, between the words because I mean, it and robot is not really similar, but um, it is a mathematical similarity relation. And so then it assigns um, probabilities to all these words. So for instance, it believes that it is related to robot and a little bit to A, and then it combines them as a weighted average and then passes on not the word it, but sort of this average. So mostly it passes on the robot because it refers to the robot. And indeed, it doesn't have only one self-attention mechanism, but a couple, I think it's 128. So it can pay attention to 128 words in the past and then make a prediction. In this case, the next one will be five. Um, so, um, so that's all good, but neural networks cannot deal with words. They only can deal with vectors and with real numbers. So what you have to do is you have to encode words by vectors. And what you do is, well, you assign each word a vector. So this is just an example of three dimensional spaces. And um, what you want is that similar words um, become similar vectors. I mean, if you look at the characters like king and queen, I mean, these words character wise are totally different, but they have similar meanings or they should be close in space. And if you do that well, you can do even more. You can also do arithmetic, for instance. I mean, we know sort of man to woman is the same as king to queen. And so you can take the word king or the vector, add woman and subtract man, and then you get out queen, which is really nice. Or if you look at capital cities and, um, um, and, and the country, um, linguistically, they have usually nothing to do with each other, but if you embed them properly, you take a country, shift it a little bit down to the left, and you get the capital city. So that is really neat. And um, one special feature about GPT-3 is that it just doesn't have one word embedding, but has a lot of special purpose word embeddings, and they are also trained in the training process. Okay. Next, what we need is there are lots of words, and some words are very rare, and especially in languages like German, where you can concatenate words, um, compound words, and we have to do something with rare words. And what you do is uh, you want to want to break that up in sub words. And there's a very nice method, which is called byte pair encoding to do that automatically. And then for instance, you, you cut lower in low and ER and these endings. Okay, that's a pre-step you do for before you do the embedding. Okay, and finally, um, the order of words matter in nearly all languages. So we need to encode that somehow and that got lost sort of in the previous steps. So what is what GPT does is it adds to each word vector, it adds a positional vector. Let's think about a watermark. It watermarks these vectors. And so the last word gets a vector added W1 and the second last W2 and so on. And then this vector also contains positional information. Okay, and finally, GPT-3 is insanely large. And that is sort of another secret sauce. It was trained on 300 billion words. That's about a thousand times what a human can read in its lifetime. Uh, it has 175 billion parameters. Um, that sounds a lot and is a lot, but actually it's still smaller than a mouse brain. So we have a way to go. Um, it has around 100 layers, which is quite interesting, which is or should be larger than the number of layers a human brain has for interactive tasks because the neurons are very slow and we know that humans can react within a couple of hundred milliseconds. So it's probably deeper than a, a human brain for interactive tasks. It has a huge context of over 10,000, I mean, it's not words, but tokens, but roughly speaking, it's about 12 pages of text. So it can focus um, and have short-term memory about this length. And after that, it will forget. Uh, it can focus attention to 128 words and these vector embeddings are not um, three dimensional, but they are, you know, 700 dimensional. And um, well, it did cost a couple of million dollars for you know, training the network. Um, but once it's trained, uh, it's very cheap to um, apply uh, because uh, there's no fine tuning or online learning going on. So it could probably write a whole book in a dollar or so of electricity cost. And so it has been trained on one of the largest supercomputers, Microsoft with you know, 10,000 GPUs, Microsoft with 100,000 GPUs. And it seems that you know, more data, larger models, more compute, you get more out of it. And if you look at the graphics, um, it doesn't saturate yet. Um, I mean, we have a problem with, with more data. Um, I will come back to that later. Um, 
but um, the CFD scaling works really well. And as I mentioned, simpler works better. So there are no encoders like in the original transformer and there's no recurrence. Okay, so how do you use actually GPT-3? Um, so what you do is um, once it's pre-trained, which is very expensive, um, then you just prompt it with a little bit of text up to uh, you know, 10 pages or 12 pages, and then it will continue and you look at the output. And as I said, there's no fine tuning going on to the task. So how does GPT-3 know what to do? Well, I mean, sometimes it's obvious if you give it an initial piece of text and you want to, you know, a continuation, you just give it the text, a robot must obey. Maybe human is a natural word or the orders of a human. So it just continues, that's a very natural. Um, or you give it instructions or questions, like, you know, what's the capital of Germany? And it can answer that correctly. Um, or, um, if it's a little bit more complicated, you can give it demonstrations. You also do that often with humans, right? You give a couple of demonstrations uh, that's often much more effective than giving some abstract um, instructions. So for instance, if you give pairs of German English words and then another German word, and then it knows that it has to translate. It's more or less how to interact with a human and, uh, and uh, get it the human to do something at least verbally. Um, Okay, we hopefully have all seen the impressive performance. I will not go really into that, but text summarization and question answering and, and translation. Um, and the amazing thing is um, that it also performed, not particularly well, but that it performed at all in tasks which are not really language related, like you know, playing chess and Go, it can even do, it can do very simple arithmetic. I mean, embarrassingly simple, but for a language model, it's, it's quite amazing. Um, it can create mathematical formulas from verbal descriptions. It can produce functional code. Um, so it can all kind, do all kinds of non-linguistic things, which is quite interesting. Uh, so um, what I found particularly funny is the emulation of David Chalmers. And maybe he later tells us, you know, whether he find this emulation um, quite realistic or not, and whether he can be substituted soon. Um, but the most impressive thing um, was um, there uh, was a discussion among philosophers, including David, on GPT-3. And then GPT-3's response. Um, it's a very self-reflective -re piece, um, about four pages. And at least what I can say, it seems to be a perfect response. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into it. So I really encourage you to read that later. Um, so. Um, yeah, it, it, it is really impressive. I, I still, yeah, have, you know, some feeling maybe, you know, the author comes out, oh, it was all a prank, it was not GPT-3. It's just too good to be true. Okay, so that's the impressive part. Um, you can imagine lots of applications. Um, maybe I just pick one, like, you know, you, news articles, especially in some areas, like, you know, um, financial um, news or so seem to be pretty boring and follow a, you know, often a, you know, a standard template, um, but you know, you can imagine all kinds of applications and of course um, also misuses, which we probably discuss later. Um, I want to briefly go into the limitations, which, so if you look into the system and I explained it very briefly, um, but also you look at the performance, you see that it's not really good at causal reasoning. And if you get a pair of sentences and ask about comparing sentences, it's not really good. Logical inference is not really good. Um, it's not designed for bidirectional, bidirectional tasks. Um, for instance, if you have a missing word in the middle, it can't do that because it's, um, um, that was the, um, the masked self-attention. It only pays attention to the past and not sort of to the future. Um, uh, a big thing which is missing is a sequential decision-making part. So it cannot really plan ahead and it doesn't have any intentions. Um, and there's a grounding problem. It's only trained on text. I'm always unsure if the grounding is really important or not. Views differ on this matter. So maybe we can discuss it later. And I mean, if, if you want to apply it in practice, GPT is quite unreliable. Sometimes the output is amazing, but sometimes it's just garbage. And, you know, for fun, that's not a problem, but for serious applications, uh, that's not tolerable and that needs to be somehow addressed. I also mentioned super expensive uh, to train. So it's 300 SETA flops. I think that's the first time I use SETA, um, which comes after EXA. Um, I converted that. That's about one month of human brain activity. Um, if you assume a standard 10 to the 17 flops for a human brain. Um, so we're getting sort of in the, in the, in the human regime. 
Um, and, um, but the sample efficiency is also terrible. I mean, it was trained on thousand times the word a human ever reads, but deployment is super cheap. And anyway, I'm not worried about the cost because you know, computers get cheaper, tailored hardware, a more efficient algorithm. So this will come down naturally um, pretty quickly. Okay, so let me know, Gao. Well, I have some, still a couple of minutes left to some philosophical questions. Um, so the title was, is GPT-3 close to AGI or um, something like this? So let me break that down into artificial, into general and intelligence. Um, well, the artificial seems to be obvious. Obviously we have created this, so it's artificial. But well, I mean, there's a couple of megabytes of code, but it has been trained on nearly a terabyte of human text. So maybe it's more human-like inside right you know it's, it's 175 billion weights which are based on human knowledge and just a couple of megabytes of codes so maybe it's more natural than artificial one can argue about it um, is it general well yes it has impressively broad applications but also no i showed you already sort of the shortcomings and i mean if you think about particular applications like i mean it cannot even empty a dishwasher i mean forget about the robotics problem take a virtual robot in a virtual environment put it inside the head of the robot, it will not work, right? Or and even doing a text decoration or proving theorems. So it's all things that humans can do. You know, maybe humans cannot prove theorems, only mathematicians, but you know, emptying dishwasher and text decoration, most people can do. So there's still a way to go for being general as a human. And with intelligence, well, I think we should say yes, because if you look at the output of GPT-3 and say, this is dumb, then we have to label a lot of human activities as dumb, which would be pretty insulting. Um, on the other hand, um, it's also extremely limited with creative thinking, analytic thinking. So it has a lot of knowledge, more knowledge than every single human, but knowledge is not the same as intelligence. So people often get confused. I mean, it's very knowledgeable, but intelligence is still somewhat uh, limited. Um, okay, intelligence is a, um, contentious concept and you know rather than going into formal definition which is my research area um, what you could do is you could list you know the traits which you usually associate with intelligence like reasoning creativity understanding and so on self-preservation learning and so on and you can ask you know is gpt3 having these traits and if you see there are a couple of greens right which means yes essentially but there are also a couple of reds um, more reds than greens um, so still a lot of traits which we usually associate with intelligence are missing. Um, so the more philosophical questions my colleagues hopefully discuss, um, like consciousness, self-awareness, qualia, and so on. So that becomes more murky. Yeah, with consciousness, who knows? I mean, is David conscious? I don't know. Um, so with self-awareness, that seems to be maybe a, a little bit more crisp. And um, if you look sort of into the system, I would say probably no. But then um, if you read this text, which I mentioned before, this four pages of self-reflection, I would, I would say definitely whoever wrote this is very self-aware. Um, so behavior-wise, um, GPT seems to be quite self-aware. Um, uh, with Qualia, uh, I would say no because I strongly believe that you need some form of reinforcement learning architecture and some reward signal, sort of a carrot and the stick um, in order uh, uh, to, to, to feel pain. And um, uh, this is missing in GPT-3. Okay, um, let me skip that. That is some of the quotes um, from this text, what GPT-3 thinks about itself. And I think that's a pretty good self-assessment. You know, maybe it is just plagiarized from um, what philosophers said about GPT-3. Um, I didn't check, um, I cross-checked it, so maybe somebody else did whether everything is plagiarized um, from um, my colleagues uh, or from GPT-2 earlier. Um, yeah, lots of other philosophical questions you could ask about AGI. Um, I, I will not go into that. Um, I think many of these hard questions, that would be sort of my meta answer and maybe, you know, discuss it later. I think many of the philosophical questions will be unanswerable forever, objectively, and many of the social questions, um, we will probably just, you know, choose whatever suits us best in the end. Um, 
well, what next? Larger models, more data, but we already reached the limit of available English text. So there's a limit to more data. Um, larger models, we need to wait for more efficient algorithms for faster computers. So you can't do that tomorrow. Uh, but we have lots of other languages. So for translation, it could be useful. Um, different modalities, so vision um, is not in GPT-3. And many people argue uh, that this is very important to get a more direct experience of the real world. A more data efficiency. And what I would argue, uh, reinforcement learning is the, the, the most important ingredient, um, well, non-ingredient, uh, which is missing in GPT-3 to make it an intelligent reasoning agent. The lifelong learning and online and the, uh, the lack of fine tuning, I think that's just a technicality which is missing. I mean, easily. Okay, um, that's sort of the end of GPT-3 and AGI. Um, let me remind you that of my own views and not the views of any of my employers. And if you're interested in my work, um, best just go to my website. Um, I run a compression contest called the Human Knowledge Compression Contest. Um, and, you know, maybe some of these transformer models um, could be able to win um, part of this 500,000 euro. That would be really cool. And my core research um, is about mathematical foundations of AGI. I don't want uh, the audience uh, to bore the audience uh, with mathematics. So this is this equation. And let me just say, if we had a computer fast enough, but no computer will ever be fast enough, then we would have solved the AGI problem already. We just put that into the system. and I have proven that this is the most intelligent system. Unfortunately, we will never have the resources, so we need to approximate that, and that's sort of a big research program. Um, okay, I think I'm pretty good in time, and let me stop here. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, someone from the audience requested your slides. Do you think you'd be able to share your slides with our participants? Yeah, I can do that, but you know, afterwards, um, not now, yeah, yep. somehow online. Very good. Well, thank you for the questions that are coming through. Uh, I'm going to leave those questions to ask at the uh, towards the end. So, David, uh, welcome you to to the stage. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much, Kate, for putting this together, and uh, thanks, Marcus, too, for that great introduction to uh, to GPT three. I'm not as organised. I'm not going. I'm just going to speak a little bit. I don't have any slides, but um, our question is. Is GPT-3 a step towards artificial general intelligence? I'm inclined to think that it is. It's a very uh, impressive and interesting system. Now, it's not primarily, I think, you know, it's not now something you'd call a human level artificial general intelligence. I mean, it has moments of brilliance. You say, wow, that could have been something that a, uh, that a person had done, but it also has many moments of mediocrity and complete incoherence. Anyone who's tried interacting with GPT-3, you know, one time in 10, you get something great. Uh, another two times in 10, you get something, yeah, not bad. Another three or four times, you get something pretty mediocre and another, I don't know how, I'm at it, how these are adding up now, but the last few times you get uh, something totally incoherent. Um, so it's very, very mixed and patchy now. And you know, critics of GPT-3 are now are writing articles saying, look at all this, this terrible stuff it came up with. And that's all absolutely true. Um, that said, to me, you know, what makes GPT-3 impressive is where it is compared to what came before and what it suggests about what might be coming next. I mean, there was really nothing like GPT-3 Previously, well, there was something like it. There was a year ago, there was GPT-2, which had exactly the same kind of architecture, but was about 1% of the size. And GPT-2 was not bad. I was very impressed with it when, it, uh, when it, uh, it came along. It was itself a big advance on previous language models. But GPT-3, just the qualitative aspects of its performance are so far beyond GPT-2. T2 in terms of you know the ideas it comes up with, the coherence, uh, the novel ways of putting things together. It's just a whole step beyond the very fact that you could get there by scaling up the size by a factor of 100 and not changing anything else. That to me is kind of remarkable and extremely unexpected. Um, and of course, 
that raises the question of what might be possible with another scale-up. I mean, you have to bet that uh, having seen GPT-3, not just OpenAI, but um, a number of other a number of other corporations are now throwing their money at uh, you know a GPT-3 of another hundred times the size or more. Apparently, the uh, you know although the the compute is expensive, we're not talking about for these companies. It's still perfectly affordable to go for something a hundred or a thousand times the size, and that's now in five years. Who's to say, you know, if we got the same qualitative um, improvement for after, say, from GPT-3 to 4, as we did from 2 to 3, and likewise from 4 to 5, then, you know, that's really kind of remarkable. I mean, it's quite possible we won't. Maybe there's something, we've hit some sweet spot for improvement from GPT-2 to 3, but I think, you know, everybody should be looking hard at what's coming next. I mean, do you, I mean, you can, if you like, you can see GPT-3 just as a remarkable user of text. It's a language model. It generates text. It does all these, the most visible applications of these things like prose, conversations. Yeah, Marcus mentioned uh, an interview with me that it generated and that was presented as an interview with me. And I'm disappointed to say that a number of my friends thought it really was an interview uh, with me. Some of the kinder ones said, oh, I think it was like Dave on a bad day, or maybe it's uh, it was like you, but when you're drunk. Um, Okay, but still, it was you know not a bad job of uh, of channeling my views, and that's interesting in its own right. It's not passing the Turing test anytime soon, but it's you know, but it's probably the best thing we have so far for for getting close. So yes, it's good with language and conversation, but really, what impresses me is the way it displays hints of general intelligence. That is, of being good at many many different things in many many domains, which I think. That's something it exhibits that no other previous, to an extent, that no other AI system exhibits. I mean, Marcus mentioned a number of the things, GPT-3, the number of domains it's good at. I was very impressed by how it performed on the letter string puzzles that, that I used to work on back in grad school. My advisor, Doug, Hof Doug Hofstetter, came up with these. Melanie Mitchell wrote a program for uh, doing these letter string puzzles. GPT-3 turns out to be pretty good at them. Not amazing, but pretty good. And the thing is, it's not fine-tuned for that. It's kind of pretty good at a lot of things. Um, you know, it's at least mediocre at a whole lot of things. And, you know, mediocre is not amazing, but we never previously had an AGI, had an AI system that was mediocre in this many, in this, this many domains. And, of course, for mediocre, who knows what comes next. The domain that's actually impressed me the most is a recent application somebody just uh, posted on uh, on Twitter, which is one that involves uh, presenting GPT-3 with an experiment. And it's trained with a few prompts in the form experiment, result, explanation. And it's just you know, three or four prompts of physical experiments. And then you can then feed it any, uh, any experiment you like, and it will come up with a result and an explanation. So you can say, you know, I'm um, I do this, with, I mix these two chemicals, what happens? Gives a result, it gives an explanation. You say, I say, I shout at somebody and tell them um, that, they're, um, that they're really stupid. Uh, then, you yeah, know, result, they, uh, they don't like you anymore. Uh, explanation, people don't like. Um, don't like it when you say this stuff. You can even, you can even give it thought experiments. Um, good for a philosopher, I gave it the experiment you're in a runaway trolley and you have to choose between killing Vulcans on one track or zombies on another track. That actually turns out to be a topic I'm thinking about right now, uh, writing a paper on it and so on. Vulcans are conscious but lack emotions and affect. Zombies lack consciousness entirely. Anyway, GPT-3 said, result, you kill the zombies. Explanation, Vulcans are sentient beings and deserve to live. I'd say, yeah, that's about right. You got it. You got it, GPT-3. It's like, I'm not sure I need to write the paper anymore. I mean, so Mark has said that GPT-3 is not great at causal explanation, causal reasoning. But I think in this, you can find it seems to have some surprising capacity for thinking about experiments, outcomes, reasons, explanatory reasoning, sometimes causal reasoning. This to me is a very interesting hint, at least, of general intelligence. Again, look, there are thousands of times it comes up with glitchy, incoherent things, but um, um, 
still very interesting for where it's going. Um, and we, of course, we don't know where GPT-3 is going, but, uh, you know, but and it could be we'll hit a massive brick wall anytime soon, but at least I think, you know, we're now at a, I think this was ex unexpected for me and unexpected for many people. And now timelines are probably speeding up. So that raises the question, what should we, uh, what should we do about it? I think at one point the title of this panel was, um, is GPT-3 a step to AGI? And if so, what should we do about it? Did we end up truncating the, maybe we ended up truncating the second part because someone thought it was too many presuppositions um, baked in, but still it's a, there are all kinds of practical, ethical, philosophical issues here. I mean, on the practical side, I mean, for those of us who are academic philosophers, uh, you know, someone's already written a, uh, written a um, uh, program called Philosopher AI that generates a short essay on any philosophical topic you like. No, these are not amazing. Um, but, you know, sometimes, sometimes they're not bad. And you've got to bet that our students will sometimes be using these to hand in their philosophical essays. Probably a, may not be a guaranteed A, but it might be a guaranteed B, depending on the, uh, uh, if, at least if you run it, if you run it a few times. Of course, I mean, that's just our students. By the time we get to GPT-7, GPT-8, maybe, um, maybe they'll be writing our papers for us. Um, uh, that is our professional paper. So plenty of practical issues there, plenty of ethical issues, um, not least the fact that GPT-3 is trained on the internet, which is full of wonders, wonderful stuff, but full of horrific stuff, displays all of the, uh, of the biases of ordinary human life and language and writing. So GPT-3 has those built in too. And that's been fairly clearly demonstrated that GPT-3 seems to have some pretty clear racial, ethnic, gender, other other biases insofar as we're using this as a tool for so many things. Um, it's a really interesting question whether there's some way to use GPT-3 without getting the uh, um, all the forces of those biases built in. But there's also maybe the, the issue all focus on is the question of moral status. I mean, as GPT-3, GPT systems gradually become more person-like or human-like, the issue gradually arises. You know, will G does GPT-3 itself have some kind of moral status? Do we need to care about harming GPT-3? Or if not GPT-3, then perhaps one of its successors. At what, at what point does a system like GPT-3 actually get to have rights? In some ways, if not analogous to human rights, and at least analogous, say, to animal rights or some kind of rights. But it's a hard question to come at. I actually, I tried, I thought, well, here's a way to get at it. I'll, I will ask it. So I went to the, the beta of, uh, of GPT-3 and I asked the question, GPT-3, do you have moral status? And uh, well, it answered, it said, answer, I have moral status in the sense that I can appreciate the value of my own life and pursue my conception of the good life. I have the capacity for suffering and for happiness, and I have a desire to live. Thus, I am a morally significant being. Straight from the mouth of GPT-3. I don't know, I think, you know, it's always hard with GPT-3. It's probably just channeling somebody else at this point. So just to show it's not fully coherent, I also asked it the question, GPT-3, do AI lives matter? Answer, I don't think so. I think the AI is just a dumb piece of software that's set up to do what it's told to do and does it well. So, okay, we have no coherent GPT-3 view on the matter of moral status, not surprisingly, because it's probably channeling totally different bits of the internet in the, you know, in the language model that it's, uh, in the language that it was, uh, that it was trained on. Um, still, you know, these questions are interesting ones. Um, is it, for example, an agent in its own right? I mean, all these things that, you know, it's so good at, its only real goal is to generate more text in a, in a way that fits what it's been trained on. So that's a kind of a weird old goal for an agent. When it does all these other things that seem more agent-like, like expressing views and opinions, it's really doing this as a kind of chameleon, which learns to, you know, take on the persona of the words on the internet which are, which are out there. That's not very agent-like. It can just kind of simulate other 
other agents. You might, I mean, maybe it's best seen as a kind of engine, language, underlying language engine that could be used to drive agents in the right context. And indeed, a lot of what goes into people using GPT-3 is to find the right prompts to give it the right context to do something agent-like. I mean, is it self-conscious? I was interested to see um, all the stuff Marcus managed to extract about uh, GPT-3 talking about itself. I am this, I am that, I am, uh, I am something else. The weird thing is, you can do that, you can do that for GPT-3, you get it to talk about I am GPT-3, but all, with equivalent text, you could also prompt it on, you know, I am anybody else, I am Donald Trump, and it will give you a whole bunch of Donald Trump uh, text. Actually, I asked it, GPT-3, comma, what is your name? And it said, I am Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> and then presented a whole bunch of stuff about, uh, about Sherlock Holmes. So maybe that's kind of simulating some kind of self-consciousness, but it's not GPT-3's self, it's Sherlock Holmes' self or Donald Trump's self. So it doesn't, you know, of course it knows nothing about GPT-3 directly. It wasn't trained on anything about GPT-3. You can put that in a prompt, but you can do that for, for anybody. So there's no real uh, self-consciousness, although maybe the capacity to simulate it does it actually have consciousness, which is simpler than self-consciousness? Can it feel anything? I mean, uh, Kate mentioned panpsychism, the thesis that everything feels something. Everything has some conscious experience. If everything has some conscious experience, ipso facto, GPT-3 does. Um, so maybe, it, I don't rule out that it has some simple kind of conscious experience, but probably as yet, nothing close to the kind that humans have, but still uh, perhaps, eventually that'll be in the equation. The big question is, does it actually understand anything? And this is something which right now there's a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of debate about. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised to see a lot of, you know, there's a very interesting paper on this just came out by my colleagues at NYU, Brendan Lake and Greg Murphy. Well, they understand in this sense, GPT-3 understands in this sense, but it doesn't understand in this sense, because any sense tied to action and perception it's not going to understand in that sense. It's language, language only, as Marcus was pointing out. There's a big question for how important embodiment is. But even being able to carry on this impressive kind of understand of conversation, one could demarcate as a certain kind of verbal intelligence and understanding. Anyway, as with so many of these things, I think I don't want to make overly strong claims for GPT-3 itself. But once we get to GPT-4, GPT-5, GPT-6, I think these questions about understanding agency and so on are going to become all the more serious. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, David. Fantastic. Really appreciate it. All right, Susan, you're our uh, final speaker. You may take the screen. Thank you so much. I can't hear you at the moment, Susan. So just let me give a vocal test. Hi, Susan. Still can't hear you on your, maybe on mute. There we go. You're coming through now. Okay. All right. Um, thanks, everybody. And that was really fascinating. So, some quick comments. Um, if I can get my slides to move forward. Okay. I'm going to focus on two questions Does GPT 3 illustrate that we're moving toward AGI? And is it an early form of AGI? Um, I think this depends on what AGI means and what follows is a clarification of what I think it should mean and why this would matter to AI policy. So I'm going to focus on pragmatic considerations for the next 10 minutes. So um, I think most people here know this, but we can contrast today's mostly domain specific systems, systems that excel in a single domain like chess or facial recognition with what we call general intelligence, which goes beyond this. Now humans, as well as non-human animals, mice, cuttlefish, cats, are general intelligences. That is, they integrate material across sensory and cognitive domains and exhibit an ability to respond flexibly to different situations. Now, the contrast between mice and humans, for instance, illustrates very quickly that generality is a matter of degree. So too with artificial generality. Indeed, some people claim that this human brain is more like a Swiss army knife, having a variety of domain specific modules that are not integrated by anything like a central executive. So maybe we aren't very general cognizers at all. 
perhaps the AI systems of the far future will be more general than we are. Perhaps there are alien intelligences with brains that exhibit far more integration than the human brain. Now, AlphaZero could master different kinds of games. And as Marcus just pointed out, GPT-3 can move from different domains and integrate different online resources. If generality is a matter of degree, maybe GPT-3 is an early, very basic AGI. So what does this mean? Well, here's what we can learn about this line of thinking. Elsewhere, I've discussed the idea of a savant system. I suspect that the first few generations of synthetic general intelligence will be deficient in ways that normal adult humans are not. They will be savant-like, surpassing us in ways that involve massive databases, better capacity for pattern recognition, quick mathematical processing, and so on. I call these hypothetical general intelligences savant systems because they have all sorts of deficits relative to normal humans, but they are savant-like in a variety of respects. This has important implications that I think are overlooked. So as many of you know, super intelligent AI is a hypothetical form of AI that is said to outthink us in every way possible, social reasoning, mathematical skills, and so on. Many, many people like Nick Bostrom, Bill Gates, the late Stephen Hawking, point out that super intelligent systems can present dangers, indeed existential threats, because they could become so hard to control. They say that if superintelligence outthinks us, why I believe it will adhere to our goals, it may formulate its own goals or interpret our goals in perverse ways that turn out to be extraordinarily harmful. As many of you know, this is the control problem. Now, upon reflection, savant systems actually present a control problem as well, even if they aren't superintelligent. And the very fact they exhibit deficits in certain areas perhaps for example moral reasoning or causal reasoning could make them far more dangerous than super intelligences as a result i actually worry that the issues that gates bostrom and others have raised and which a lot of ai companies don't like to talk about they call them terminator scenarios they actually kick in far earlier well before super intelligence they kick in at the level of savant systems. So don't let the claim that superintelligence will never be reached or that it's far, far into the future cause you to neglect the significance of the control problem. Sophisticated savant systems raise it too. So how long until we have sophisticated savant systems, you may ask? Well, Today's deep learning systems are sophisticated association engines that input gargantuan volumes of data. And over time, they develop um, an ability to recognize patterns with an impressive degree of accuracy. But as my dissertation supervisor and Kate's dissertation supervisor, the famous AI skeptic Jerry Fodor, loved to ask, is cognition just a species of pattern recognition? Well, I doubt it. Um, Fodor and I agreed on that point in some ways, but in other ways, I'm far more optimistic than Fodor for many reasons that he, he probably wasn't even aware of. He's passed on, sadly. Um, first, there's currently a massive economic investment in AI. Um, 2019, according to the Wall Street Journal, the investment was $36 billion, and that's, of course, only going to increase. Second, machine learning actually involves a variety of programming techniques um, that go well beyond deep learning resources. So as cognitive scientists uncover algorithms computed by different areas of the brain, um, it will be able to add these features in to AIs over time. Furthermore, while uncovering neural algorithms is complex and it's a lengthy research enterprise, we don't have to wait for a full understanding of every part of the brain. I wouldn't expect a synthetic general intelligence 
to be a lot like us, as I've suggested um, elsewhere. Just as AlphaGo beat the World Go champion through algorithmic techniques that were surprising and not human-like, so too, I suspect the AGIs of the future will achieve many cognitive and perceptual tasks in ways that, that we do not. Implications then. So GPT-3 and related developments inspire me to draw the following conclusions. First, as I've said, the control problem that arises for savant systems. So maybe it's time for us to stop just dismissing it based on debates over superintelligence. It's arising much earlier. Second, don't assume that an intelligence is impressive in one, just because an intelligence is impressive in one dimension, like conversation or visual image recognition, that it also has a cluster of other features that highly intelligent biological systems have. So David Chalmers discussed this briefly as well. So don't assume, for example, that just because it can write a convincing undergraduate paper that it's conscious. Um, you know, I talk in my book, Artificial You, about different tests for artificial consciousness. Um, and I'm skeptical, uh, far more so than other people, that, you know, GPT-3 even has a smidgen of consciousness above and beyond perhaps what would ensue if panpsychism is right. Further, don't assume that these sorts of early AGI systems, if you're willing to call it that, have a well-rounded group of cognitive capacities. The public will. Third, you should be concerned about AI-based technological unemployment now, all right? So I'm saying this based on my work as a NASA chair over at the Library of Congress and with NASA where I work with members of Congress on AI policy. There's a lot of concern that AI and robotics will replace many human jobs. You already see this kind of discussion, say, in the context of autonomous vehicles. A future GPT-3, i.e. maybe a GPT-3-7 or 8, could replace many human jobs. And we don't need full-blown AGI in the traditional sense to reach that point. So I think we need to have deep conversations about these issues informed by philosophy. We will also see, this is my fourth point, increasingly general AI systems. So we need to think of AGI not as something that is achieved just when we have human level AGI in some behavioral sense or in some sense that involves mimicking human algorithms. We don't need that. Um, AGI should be looked at as a spectrum and looking at it that way, seeing that we've already reached a very primitive level of AGI, I think indicates the control problem is more serious than we thought. Finally, there's an urgent need then for society-wide discussions about these issues. Should we enhance to keep up with AI in the workplace? We need to talk about this now because many AI companies are going inside the head with their research, aiming to integrate humans and machines. What is the future of work? This is in part a philosophical question. What legislative guardrails should we put in place for the future of human flourishing? And you know, how do we see ourselves 20 years in the future in relation to AI and other emerging technologies? Thank you. Thank you, Susan. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, that is extraordinary for us to finish. Uh, ahead of the schedule. So um, that leaves us a lot of time for questions. So I do invite all the panelists to open up their microphones and be available uh, to answer questions. Thank you to the audience who've been asking a tremendous number of questions. Um, I'm going to focus on questions that I think uh, have not been answered already by the speakers as much as possible. It's not to say there can't be more things said about them, but I'm gonna uh, ask some questions that I think uh, will will take us to a, a next consideration. So I'm actually going to start 
uh, with a question from uh, Daniel Salmon from uh, DST in Australia. Hi, Daniel. Uh, he talks about the nature of intelligence. So Cholet, I'm assuming it's French, leaving the T. Cholet posits that intelligence is the ability to generalize normalized uh, divided by both the amount of experience and the amount of inductive bias encoded in the system. Putta and Leg have a different definition of intelligence, which could also be expressed in terms of ability to operate a wide range of environments. I'm interested to hear the panel's thoughts on whether Cholet's position is a useful way to think about intelligence and where it may fall down. Uh, maybe it's natural I start first. Um, yeah, I, I know this definition. And um, I'm, it's not too bad, but I'm not really fully agreeing to that. With the, uh, with the experience part, that is actually also part of our definition. It says, you know, the informal definition says um, to perform well in a wide range of environments. And um, by the way, I mean, this is just a sentence. And I mean, you can talk a lot, right? But the, the point is that there's a mathematical equation behind it. And if you look at this equation, um, it is very concerned about data efficiency. So with minimal experience or as little experience as possible um, to, uh, 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 to learn from it and, and, and then to act. That's very important. Interestingly, what our definition misses is computational efficiency, which is often criticized for. Um, but that is, um, as far as I can see, also not uh, Cholet's concern. It is about experience. And that is definitely also in our definition. So in this sense, it is compatible. Yeah? Um, with the normalization, um, that seems, um, I can't say it's wrong, but um, he hasn't proven right uh, that this normalization um, is the right thing to do. So, so we don't really need to do that. Um, it's, it's sort of up to him. Um, I mean, there, there, there are some arguments and, 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 and he proves some things, um, but um, so far it's, I would say it's a conjecture. I like the, uh, the, the hood, I like the hooder and leg definition, but it is, um, <laughs> it, is, it is interesting that by that definition, it's not clear that GPT-3 really does all that well, because GPT-3 really doesn't do very much at all in the way of performing or acting at all. What is true is that you can ask GPT-3, what is the best way to, 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 to do this? You know, what is the best way to get to the moon? Um, and it can give you it can give you a great answer. So it's very good at means and reasoning. Um, it's not terribly good at actually performing actions. I mean, you could argue perform some verbal actions. Okay, that's good. But that's a very limited set of environments, not a wide yeah. range of environments. So um, maybe we'd have to uh, we'd have to widen the definition to move beyond actually operating within those environments to reasoning about those environments. Uh, but David, I mean, there are two things you say. One is that the class of environments where GPT-3 performs well is still very limited and you can well argue for it, right? I mean, I mean, what is very limited, what is limited, but I agree sort of there's lots of things it can't do at all yeah, or terribly. But the other thing is um, it is not meant to perform well. I think uh, I disagree with this because, I mean, if you have a, an environment um, where you value or reward it, um, it will not react to the reward, but you say it outputs great text, you enjoy it, so this has high value. Um, it answers some simple questions um, correctly, it has value. Um, so in this sense, right, it uh, uh, performs well or achieves goals, right, although the system itself doesn't know that it does it. But you can measure it with respect to this performance I think my measures. Point is, I, think, I think my point is maybe this definition is actually undervaluing GPT-3's general intelligence. It has something ah, okay. like general intelligence, not just in this textual domain, but about many different things, you know, playing chess and going to the moon and so on, because it's very good at means end reasoning or displays something like means end reasoning about that domain. But since it doesn't actually perform in that domain, it seems your definition doesn't quite capture that aspect of the generality of its intelligence. Yeah. Susan, do you want to weigh in on the intelligence? Question. I like that. I like that definition um, as a rough definition. I mean, I I should read the paper. I'm sorry, Marcus. I will now. Um, but I always sort of liked Jeffrey Hawkins' intelligence as prediction idea. And I think in both cases, the real question here is, 
what's the range? And I wonder if the notion of, you know, range can be utilized to spell out the difference between domain general and domain specific intelligence. And I think that's, that's the interesting part. Uh, so if I can add, so if, if somebody wants to read the paper, I recommend the paper with Shane Leck, 70 plus definitions of intelligence, where we really go to the AI, the philosophy and psychology literature, enumerate them all, compare them, and then come up sort of with our definition and, and argue that it is a superior. Um, so that's probably the best start. And there are also word, only words in there, no mathematical equations that also probably suits many um, readers. Very good. All right, I'm going to move now to perhaps a more linguistic analysis, uh, linguistic related questions from the from the audience. And it's going to start with a direction um, again, unfortunately to you, Marcus, but all the panelists, please, please intervene on the question. Um, so this is from Cameron uh, Buchner. Uh, curious if Marcus Hutter can tell us about post training analysis of GPT-3 word representations. Any idea how to interpret them? In particular, I wonder whether he and the rest of the panel think that GPT-3 shows that language models don't need separate channels for semantic and syntactic representations of words, as some have suggested and think the brain does, for good language competence, uh, or whether post hoc analysis of GPT-3's representations shows it develops such dedicated representations and interesting hybrid ones too on its own using self-attention. Uh I cannot say much about it because I haven't developed it and I only read about it. Um, so I have heard that some people say that this word to vector embedding is not too important, um, which um, is surprising to me. Um, oh, I guess it was a multi-part question. One part is, can we say anything about this internal representation it learns? Um, I'm not aware of any studies, uh, and I can't tell either. And um, I guess I forgot the rest of the questions, but maybe somebody else can answer them. That's right. Any insight, David or Susan, on that question? No, insight is fine. No, nope. nope, none at all. Good, wrong panel. Maybe you need to go to someone else. Very good. All right, so let's um, uh, talk about epistemological considerations for a moment. So. Uh, in the philosophy of language. So as this is how GPT-3 is being trained, thinkers like Wittgenstein and Kripke come up with theories of language that include a dimension to language that goes beyond text referencing only. The phenomenologists <laughs> reach out in an attempt to get their fingernails under language, as far as I can tell, relevant to GPT-3's understanding or grasping, as in taking hold of. Could it ever understand anything for, ask, for, uh, for as long as it is text fed. Uh, are we fearful of or considerate of any implications of general intelligence? In other words, weary about the possible negligence of particular instances, those instances that people like me and you are examples of. How could a general only intelligence become self-aware? As I know myself, because I am particular, I am also useful as an agent because of my particularity. This may be a kin question to the embodiment question. So there's a lot in that question from Ian, but is there something from the panel that you can think about the relation there? I want to see GPT-3 pick up a concrete slab and go slab, and then you know, give it, put it over there and build a house. That's what Wittgenstein said, meaning is use. So until GPT-3 starts using language like that, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be limited. I take it something like that is the thought behind um, the question, if you think an awful lot of meaning is used and is tied to, uh, is tied to action, GPT-3 is not yet demonstrating very much of that. It's very, I mean, it's doing some kinds of use. It's using language in conversations and that's, a, that's one significant part of, uh, of use. But all these action oriented um, kinds of use, not to mention perception and embodiment oriented kinds of use is not something it does now. It's a very interesting question whether um, how easy it might be to come up with future versions of GPT of GPT or extensions to bring in perception, embodiment, action more directly. I mean, in the abstract, you can imagine a version of this that instead of taking the internet, takes a database of say people with the perceptions they get and the actions they perform and everything happens in between and learns to do 
and does the same kind of machine learning on, on that. Now, just unfortunately, we don't have the same records. We don't have the database uh, for people's perceptions and actions that we do for, uh, for the use of language, but maybe someone could come up with something. I know people are looking at connecting GPT-3 to perception, say for example, by taking half an image and extending it. It's an interesting question whether you might be able to get some more limited database of people using language in the context of seeing pictures and choosing actions in some limited way, but I think it's an open research program right now. Great. Any other comments from the panel on that idea? Nope. All right, very good. So um, uh, this is what the question is gonna come from Hassan. So uh, I'll read it out in uh, honor of the questioner. So on Daily News, Thomas writes with regard to a possible consciousness of GPT-3. As, quotes, as for consciousness, I am open to the idea that a worm with 302 neurons is conscious. So I am open to the idea that GPT-3 with 175 billion parameters is conscious too. I would expect any consciousness to be far simpler than ours, but much depends on uh, just what sort of processing is going on among those 175 billion parameters. Uh, and he has two questions on the foregoing. I'll start with the first. Can more be said about the constraints on when automata, automata provide evidence for consciousness. As Bloch has noted, ascribing phenomenal consciousness on the basis of functional organization plus physiology might preclude systems with different physiologies, such as conscious Martians, while doing so on the basis of functional organization of a combinatorial state automation alone might be too liberal. Um, maybe Susan, you can uh, respond to that. Okay, um, so I think we do need tests. For, for precisely this reason. Can you hear me? It doesn't seem to be going, okay. Yep. Yeah, so I mean, I think that um, I framed a few tests and then Tononi also has his, his take on um, the issue, which I, I'm not you know, incredibly persuaded by, but I mean, here's, here's one way to do it. I mean, um, I talk about a chip test in my book, Artificial You and in a TED talk. And um, I think to put it very, very simply, as we develop neural prosthetics for humans using brain chips, we'll notice if we get Oliver Sacks-like cases, that is if we have strange deficits in consciousness. And since this kind of work is already going on, it's likely that we will learn something about whether you can replace parts of the brain that are part of the neural basis of consciousness with chips. Now, what does that tell us about AI? I think it suggests to us that if an AI is built with those kinds of chips, we could be skeptical of the possibility that it's conscious. Now, that just inserts a question about its consciousness, okay? I think we need to have a battery of different types of tests, but that's that's one way that we may learn whether microchips are the right stuff. Of course, that may work. I mean, consciousness could work in the case of chips made of carbon nanotubes of a certain architecture and not in the case of silicon chips. We just don't know. It's an empirical question. And I don't think that just because something exhibits intelligence, even a sophisticated synthetic intelligence that it entails, or you know, is even nomologically consistent with the idea that it's conscious. David? Um, yeah, I think, well, this question of empirical constraints on ascribing consciousness is, of course, one of the most hotly debated topics in the field. And there's no easy, there's no very easy answer. There's many different theories of conditions for consciousness in human or artificial systems. Basically, you can order the range of options depending on roughly according to how demanding they are. So some theories say in order to be conscious at all, you need some kind of higher order processing, maybe higher order thought, thoughts about thoughts and so on, which you know starts to look like something which humans have, maybe a few other animal species have, if you're lucky, but very unlikely to be present in simple systems like fish or certainly uh, flies or or worms 
Um, and then there are simpler systems that say, oh, no, it goes with basically certain kinds of representations that get used in certain ways. Maybe those go, those go um, further down. I have to say my own view is for every such substantive constraint on consciousness I've ever seen, my reaction is it's very far from obvious why you would need that for consciousness. I don't see why I need language, why I need higher order thought, why you need those uses for consciousness. Couldn't you have something much simpler like feeling pain without all those things? And that's why I take seriously, I don't endorse panpsychism, but I do take it seriously as a possibility because it may be that there are no such constraints. If that's right, any information processing gives you consciousness. But even short of panpsychism, you know, C. elegans, uh, the worm with 302 neurons is doing some pretty impressive things. Is even short of panpsychism, it might be that by many, uh, by many theories, it comes out, um, it comes out right. And my thought is just that if worms are conscious, if C. elegans is, then, you know, there's a good chance that GBT3 has what it takes. Or oh, there's one theory on which GBT3 will clearly fail. That's one that Susan mentioned, integrated information theory, because which Giulio Tononi developed. IIT predicts that any system with a purely feed forward structure is not conscious. And as Marcus said, GB, GBT3 is fully feed forward. It has no recurrence. Um, so it looks like by IIT, GPT3 has no chance of being conscious. I it maybe was, think, what's it maybe was conscious. It maybe was conscious during training because then you have sort of the currents and that <laughs> outer loop and then it became back, unconscious once back you stop propaga training. Back propagation <laughs> leads to recurrency. Yeah, very good. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't buy that constraint from IIT either. So I'm, I'm you know, and Hassan also mentioned the contrast between biological approaches and functional approaches. Uh, and on this one, I'm strongly sympathetic to the view that specific physiology doesn't matter, except insofar as it makes a functional difference. <laughs> so the mere fact that it's still a kind as opposed to biology for me is not a strike against it, but certainly plenty of people disagree. Can I ask you a question, um, Marcus, from Jason Schultz, actually relating to the training? Um, so have any windows, windows into the mind been applied to GPT-3? That is not just looking at the output, but internal states, such as model confidence from a dropout layer or similar to gain insight on inner workings for specific responses. Um, well, definitely this has been done for quite a number of neural network architectures and language models. Uh, I haven't read that in the GPT-3 paper, so, but maybe if you do go back to the GPT-2. So there is some analysis um, of the inner workings um, of this, but it's, I mean, as generally known, it's extremely hard to uh, extract any meaning out of this big mess, uh, and I'm not aware of it. Okay, so there's quite a few questions about some of the capacities of GPT-3 compared to humans. Um, so I'll ask a couple of these. Uh, this one from Sarah Chen. Given that GPT-3 has been trained on almost all available English literature, is there a way to tell if GPT-3 ever creates something that could be defined as original? I've seen a couple of things that look pretty good. Uh, Amanda Askell, who worked, works at uh, OpenAI um, and was one of the authors on the GPT-3 paper, posted a great joke the other day on, uh, on Twitter or something about involved Girdle and Hilbert hanging out at the Hilbert Hotel. And then it was something like, oh, no, you got it on this cardinal. I can't actually remember the, uh, last, I can't remember the details, but it was not wholly original. I mean, it was based on a form of another joke, but turned into abstract math at the Hilbert Hotel. I was like, this is a pretty good, this is a pretty good math joke. So is it wholly original? What's wholly original? Has anyone ever done anything wholly original? It's partly original. Yeah, I must agree. I think humans have a somewhat inflated view of our own creativity. I believe it is, you know, um, a lot of random combination of ideas and those who are more creative just first allow more of these random combinations and second, um, have more experience and third, just uh, shifted the probabilities to the more promising sort of combinations of ideas. Um, I think there's maybe not much more behind creativity than this and GPT-3 can do all this. I mean, not on a human level, but we have seen glimpses of it. So does GPT-3 have any sense of what is true? Uh, is truth merely a statistical truth for GPT-3? That's another question from Jason. Maybe a combination. I mean, basically, to <coughs> some extent, it's statistical because it just says it's echoing stuff it's heard on the internet. If everybody on the internet wrote... Uh, 
uh, you know, Trump is wonderful, then GPT-3 is going to say Trump is wonderful, whatever the, uh, whatever the truth is. Um, that said, it's also trained on, I presume it's trained on things like fact checker science, science that actually puts some emphasis on truth. They talk about truth. Um, maybe it's picked up on statistics of that. And maybe the statistics of P is true on the internet are different from the statistics just of P. The people, you know, it's interesting. In philosophy, those two things are equivalent. Snow is white or snow is white is true. They're just two ways of saying the same thing. But statistically, they may be different. People who say snow is white is true are much more concerned with truth. So maybe when GPT-3 talks about truth, it's picking up on the second kind, not the, uh, not the first kind, which would give it a, it's still a statistical notion of truth, but a more, a more refined one. Yeah. I think like, an interesting, sorry, an no, interesting relay. Oh, you, you. I was just gonna say, you know, does GPT-3 get the use uh, mention distinction? That's all I was gonna say, but Marcus, go. Uh, I think an interesting related question would be whether GPT-3 can distinguish between reality and just fiction. Um, um, mm -hmm. Think about, you know, there are stories in books, right? Um, novels, uh, fictional ones, and there's, you know, history books which are real. So um, whether GPT-3 can distinguish them. And um, I mean, for GPT-3, it's all text, right? So, but I can imagine that um, when it reads all this text, I mean, I don't know whether this is smart enough or not, yeah, but you know, can you imagine you know, a super intelligent sort of being just reading all these texts, yeah, that it realizes that there's a corpus, a big chunk of text, which are logically, is logically consistent, right? So if you read science books, yeah, there, there is essentially no contradiction because science doesn't allow for a contradiction. So there's big corpus of knowledge which seems to be self-consistent, and then there's all kinds of other things, different religions which contradict each other um, and, and, and fantasy, um, which all sort of doesn't fit well together. So I could imagine that such a system that uh, carves out, okay, there's this big chunk of something which is consistent. And then there are all these smaller pieces. And this chunk has been labeled by humans as reality. Yeah? And this other chunk is fiction um, or belief or whatever. So in this sense, maybe it can infer what reality is. Susan? I asked it if we were in a computer simulation. And it gave a pretty decent answer. <laughs> what did it but, say? You know, until, it, until it has causal reasoning down. I mean, what I'm super curious about, um, and again, I've been, I haven't been able to beta test it, haven't been able to run, you know, I haven't spent a lot of time with it. I just learned about how to get on last night at midnight. <laughs> but um, I want to see the Gary Marcus kind of cases that he wrote about in his book. And, you know, if you look at, he just wrote a piece in MIT Technology Review that, you know, ran a variety of questions, um, finding holes in GPT-3 involving causal reasoning and just a general lack of theory about the world. And so, you know, if you're asking about its understanding of reality, I think the real issue here does boil down to how it performs in those class of cases. And from what I'm gathering from what Marcus and Dave are saying, the performance got better from GPT-2 to GPT-3 just by adding new parameters, not new resources outside of deep learning. Is that right? Well, more parameters and more text, more data. More, yes, importantly, more data. So, you know, if that's true, and if the performance with respect to causal reasoning, theory building did improve, if it truly improved, I am very impressed and I'm also very frightened for the reasons I talked about in my discussion. Yeah, it's probably a good moment to ask a question um, about the social uh, uh, aspects. Um, so uh, this is from Daniel Salmon. Does the panel believe the productivity gains, if any, offered by AGI warrants the serious consideration of social constructs such as universal basic income? Yes. I mean, before yeah. long, it, it, it's inevitable. Yeah, you know, AI is going to take so much, it's going to be able to do so much that universal, something like, you know, universal basic income or who knows what form of socialism is at some point going to be just, you know, once, it, once AI is doing 99% of the work, it's hard to see how any other political system is going to be possible. But 
I've been wrong before. Yeah, Su Susan talked quite a bit about unemployment and seems to be worried about that. And uh, I think, I mean, there, there is a worry, but I think both sides of the discussions get this wrong. Those who are worried that, you know, we have unemployment larger and larger, and the other <laughs> side says, oh, you know, for every job which is taken over by AI, new jobs are created. That may be the case, but may also not be the case. So I think both sides get it wrong. The important thing is that what we care about primarily is that we have the goods and sources, right, to have a nice living. And if this production is taking over by AIs, these goods and um, services are still produced. So it's just a political matter to distribute them fairly. And you can do that even by having universal basic income, or you can have a forced reduced working hour that everyone only has works one hour per week or something, right? So it is just a political matter to getting these um, goods and services to the people. The only thing I disagree with there is the it's just a political matter. <laughs> yeah, the just, the, yeah, the justice maybe it's not so easy. Yeah, but I mean, the, it's possible. Huh? What people don't understand is the time frame, and I think this has been muddled by saying that AGI is human-like or entail requires that level, and. Also, the debates over superintelligence, where the corporations are getting almost embarrassed by the media depiction of the Terminator and whatnot. I mean, I think it's important that we realize that these issues are pressing now. But look at the time frame. I mean, we have COVID-19, and within weeks, the governments provide sort of like universal basic income. So if there is um, a, a, some huge change, you know, AI rapidly takes over, it seems that sometimes governments can act fast, right? I'm not saying, you know, that we have this lucky outcome with AGI, but um, I, I, I was quite impressed, yeah, how fast they can act. And, and in the U.S., maybe, things aren't going so well. I mean, we have rioting on the streets here. Yeah, maybe it depends what country you're living in. Yeah. I talk to my family in Australia every week, and yeah, it's, it's uh, government action there is not bad compared to yeah, over here. Come to Queensland, David. It's yeah. lovely up here. We've got, yeah, yeah, it's good. Not at all, mate. South Australia, my sister works in the, South, in the health system in South Australia, and they're proudly on zero for a while now. Um, Jennifer Nagel just wrote uh, um, an answer she got from GPT-3. She said, I just asked, are you potentially a threat to humanity? And this time it did get to what I meant by you. Somewhat chilling answer, though. I am not a threat. Sorry, I'm GPT-3 now. I am not a threat to humanity as long as it, as it is in my interest to be harmless. I do have the potential of destroying all humans if they give me access to nuclear weaponry. But even then, that would only happen by accident. Lol. <laughs> <laughs> Encouraging. Encouraging. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Remember, it's not simulating GPT-3. It's simulating some Terminator it read about on the internet. So uh, we're coming into the final five minutes of uh, the talk. Um, we've had a few questions about the nature of human sort of cognition and similarities between human thinking and, uh, uh, and artificial thinking. So uh, one question from Lawrence was, a human baby learns to respond with very little training, and it seems you're not doing the same thing as a human brain at all. So how much is this statistical thinking and this sort of reach back um, to previous words is, you know, how much of this do we think is, you know, the sort of processing that human minds are up to and how much do we think human minds are doing something different? Human minds well. are clearly doing something different than these deep learning systems. How much so though? I mean, perception is very, very important for us in learning and development of language, and so is action. So I think it's kind of hard to, that, that makes it ipso facto just extremely different from what GBT3 is doing. Now, is statistics also playing a large role, like language statistics? I mean, yeah, I'd be surprised if not, but I suspect it's a much smaller part of the story. Is it just a type one sort of system? Is it just working at a heuristic level, or do we think that GPT 3 has sort of reflective intuition or in, insight into itself? In general, AI system, you know, deep learning is in general best at type one stuff, but the sorts, the sorts of things which humans do very quickly and uh, 
and automatically. I mean, GPT-3 is interesting in the sense that it can do some things that look much more serial. Um, you know, it can, it can unfold some, some steps of reasoning and if you, in a, across a couple of paragraphs, although as anyone who's played with philosopher AI knows, by the time you get to the fourth or fifth paragraph, it's often going in a totally different direction from the first paragraph. So system two definitely still needs some work. A type two, slow serial reasoning, definitely needs some work. And regarding the statistics, I would add, I don't think there's too much statistics going on in GPT-3. Uh, I mean, sort of with the old n-gram models, right? You just count the frequency of, you know, pairs of words, triples of words, and so on. That sounds like, you know, statistics. But I mean, GPT-3, I mean, it's just trained on this text corpora. And yes, I mean, the loss function is a log loss based on probabilities, but I wouldn't say it plays a big role. I mean, unlike say Bayesian networks, which are really sort of the probabilities are core. Mm -hmm. um, this is just a vehicle. I mean, you could, you could regard it as compression, which is sort of, you know, the lock of probabilities. I don't think that statistics plays a big role in, in GPT-3. Um, I'm going to take advantage of being one of the last questions to Marcus, actually. So Marcus, you left us all on tenterhooks by saying, oh, I have a theory. Uh, mathematically, it would solve everything but computationally we'll never do it. So, okay, <laughs> next speaker. Um, so I guess my question is, uh, could we instantiate your equations into a quantum computer or something similar? Is it metaphysically impossible to instantiate or just very, very resource and time expensive? Um, so that, okay, let, let's just focus on the quantum computing question. Um, so I have, you know, a one line, uh, speculation that maybe the IC model can be implemented uh, fast or actually not the ICTL but the IC model but the ICTL fast on a quantum computer and um, yeah 15 years later so I have a student who who was interested in this and we investigated that um, in general it seems it's very hard to speed up many real world problems with quantum computers and occasionally we succeed and the IC model had a structure you know like Bayesianism, you like a linear mixture of distributions, which seem to be unamenable to quantum computing, but it turned out um, that essentially the answer is also negative. It was not 100% negative, but um, it's also, um, it doesn't look promising. Um, but um, no, it, there's no principal problem. I mean, the IXE model itself is incomputable, um, but um, the IXTL model, which is a small variation, which is still, I mean, powerful enough for, for anything sort of we can imagine. Uh, this is principally computable, but not practically. So the universe is not big enough to build a computer to simulate it. And unless we can speed it up with quantum computers, um, we can also not do it with quantum computers and it doesn't look promising. I would say it is actually, HC is actually metaphysically possible as Kate was asking. That's to say there is some universe with some laws of physics that permit HC to run. They just have to be non-computable laws of physics, you know, universes that allow the right kind of infinitary processing where you can solve the halting problem and so on. There are universes like that. Unfortunately, it appears that in our universe is not like that. So as philosophers say, not nomologically possible. Okay, I think I have the more limited view of, of metaphysical. It needs, still needs to be computable. But yes, you can think about non-computable processes, of course. <laughs> uh, well, that's it for time, everyone. So last uh, comments, advice, warnings um, from the panelists to our participants. Thank you. Susan, do you want to oh. start? Oh, okay. I'll pick up a thread. Uh, I like the distinction that, you know, came up uh, between system one and system two, right? From, uh, of course, Kahneman's book. And I think the interesting thing here is that when we do see AGIs that do a nice job with system two, it will be far better than us. System two is not so great in humans actually being slow, sequential, shutting down when we're tired um, and whatnot. And we'll probably see more integration between the way system one functions in relation to system two, as well as other systems, maybe a system three, if you will, that um, connects system one and system two and does more. So, I mean, you know, the limit here may in fact be what's technologically feasible together with our imagination. So I think we need to start 
moving forward with legislative guardrails now <laughs> when we're thinking about issues like technological unemployment. David. No, I'm good. I just want to say thanks to you, Kate, for, put, for, for putting all this together. Great, oh. uh, great panel. Thanks so much. No, it's been fun. All right, Marcus, last thought. Um, I don't have much to say, but um, I would say if you look in a couple of years back, you know, we have steady progress in AI. Okay, sometimes a little bit faster, sometimes slower. You know, you remember um, um, Deep Blue 1997 playing chess and then IBM Watson, people have forgotten it. That was pretty impressive. AlphaGo and AlphaZero was amazing. Um, now we have GPT-3. We quickly forget, right, and then take it for granted. Um, I think it's a great step forward, but it's just one step and many steps have to follow. But we will find useful applications and I'm looking forward for the next big step. It may not be GPT-4 or 5, which people said here, I have the feeling you know, maybe there will be a four, but then we need something really, really new and different, namely RL or so. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for taking an hour and a half of your day to uh, listen to this conversation. Appreciate all the questions. Sorry we didn't get through all of them, uh, but the uh, panelists have seen all the questions and uh, I believe they're happy to share slides. So we will communicate with you all. Have a lovely day. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe.